Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> recording progress. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sean, Dr. Vase, Dr. Williams, for organizing all this. Um, and of course, on behalf of the uh, AL and TESOL program, I'd like to in welcome you to our second Apple um, lecture of the year. Um, we call these events Apple, not just because we are in the Big Apple, uh, but also because it's an acronym of um, Applied Linguistics and Language Education. And we owe our Apple lecture series to Language Innovations Incorporated, our link for short, a group of uh, very talented ESL teachers who organized workshops and published materials and ESL and, um, and grammar in the 70s and 80s. Um, so they made uh, an endowment that they gave funds to TC that made this lecture series possible. We also have to thank uh, Dr. Leslie Beebe for um, coming up with the idea of making a lecture series. Uh, she was the um, program director for many, many years. So the Apple lecture series uh, aim to uh, present cutting edge research and discuss current topics in our field. And uh, today's talk, uh, talk definitely fits that bill. It is very relevant, the talk. It's titled, When Can AI Improve Our Social Skills? So this topic is indeed current. And it aligns very well with our new specialization in language and technology. And it is therefore very fitting that uh, our new assistant professor, in language te technology, Dr. Eric Voss, that he will introduce the speaker. Dr. Voss. Thank you, Vivian. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Um, Asan Hock is an associate professor in computer science at the University of Rochester, where he co-leads the Rochester Human Computer Interaction Group Asan earned his PhD from MIT in 2013, where the MIT Museum highlighted his dissertation, The Development of an Intelligent Agent to Improve Human Ability, as one of MIT's most unconventional in inventions. Building on the, this work, Microsoft released Speaker Coach, which is available in PowerPoint. Asan is best known for introducing and extensively validating the idea of using AI to train and enhance elements of basic human ability. Asan and his students' work has been recognized uh, by many awards, including the NSF Career Award, uh, MIT TR35, and the Young Investigator Award by the US Army Research Office. In 2017, Science News named him one of the 10 scientists to watch and in 2020, the National Academy of Medicine recognized him as one of the emerging leaders in health and medicine. Also, Asan is a distinguished member of the Association for Computing Machinery. So please uh, join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Asan Hawk. I'm going to start my talk by taking you back in the history. Anybody remember a presidential debate from 1960? Okay, something unusual happened on that debate. <laughs> Howard said he remembers it. Um, something unusual happened on the debate. So folks who listened to the debate on radio uh, thought the other person won and the folks who watched it on TV thought JFK won. So it's quite a stark difference. So in the next slides, I'll play a video to show why that happened. The television stations of the United States are proud to provide facilities for a discussion of issues by the two major candidates for the presidency. The candidates... On September 26th... I'm not satisfied until every American enjoys his full constitutional right. Smith, Senator Kennedy... No Nixon looks exhausted. He strayed from the campaign trail 
and is recovering from the flu. He also has a knee injury, making him appear uncomfortable and shifty. The visual contrast between the men damages Nixon. Viewers think Kennedy has the edge, even though radio listeners have the opposite impression. During the debate, Kennedy's on-camera performance makes him look like a leader. Studies will later show that this debate made up the minds of four million voters. Three million vote for Kennedy. So I played that video to make two points, one point about me and one point about the audience. So as a researcher, I'm obsessed with studying human communication, human emotion. And I like computer science because it allows me to use an objective set of tools to study it. In fact, my intellectual curiosity could be explained by this almost 100-year-old quote that talks about a secret code that you use when you interact with each other that we all understand, but it's written nowhere. And I want to use computation as a tool to be able to understand the secret code. And the second point is about you. On that video clip, TV was viewed as an emerging technology. Not everybody had it. Not everybody used it. JFK was able to use on, to benefit him. And I feel that AI is in the same boat currently. You know, every single day when you wake up, we see this new technology, new stuff. For example, this morning at 6.30 a.m., this is my home screen on my phone. And it's, it's easy to feel overwhelmed of what's happening. So you can say, you know what, it's not ready yet. I will pay attention once it's ready and for its prime time. Or you can say, you know what, it's here to stay. Is there a way for me to use this technology in my practice today to get an early start? And I'm hoping in my talk today, we can start a conversation for all of us to think about what that may look like for a practice. So that's my promise for the talk. And before I start, I want to share a personal story. Um, so this, was, this is my brother of 2008. Um, he has Down syndrome and autism. And 2008, uh, that's when our mother passed away. And I became his primary caregiver, taking care of him, uh, dealing with the school, IAP, dealing with other parents. And that caregiving experience gave me a unique perspective that I was fortunate to drive my research agenda forward. And towards, in my own, t in the talk, you will see that agenda coming forward. Because when you take inspiration from your personal instances, the type of work you do is very different. So for the last 10 years, I was able to drive a research agenda on using computers to help you with conversations. I know it sounds counterintuitive. Hopefully by the end of this talk, this will become a bit more obvious. And there are multiple strands of this work. If you think about facial expression, language, prosody, my gestures, sorry, being modality, this becomes a multimodal machine learning problem. And there's also application that we can enable. And on the application domain, I've, I've been very fortunate to work with stakeholders uh, who provide practice, who provide services, because if you collaborate with them, you, have, you get a lot more mileage for the work that we do. So I don't have time to get through all of them, but in the next remaining time we have left, I'll just briefly walk you through some of the design considerations and what we have learned as you use computers to help people some of the basic social skills. So the first thing I'll tell you about is my automated conversation coach. And it was started from this gentleman who came up to me and told me that, you know what, I have Asperger's syndrome. As a result, when I start talking, I don't realize that I'm monologuing. I would love to get some help, but I fear social stigma. If there is a way for me to practice my conversation skills with a, something, with a computerized algorithm, at the privacy of my home, this will transform my life. So based on that motivation, we built a 3D character who could see you, listen to you, and respond to you in real time, and can give you feedback on your conversational skills especially in the context of a job interview. So in the next two slides, I'll show you a video of a student going through the intervention. Uh, please tell me about yourself. So 
I am a junior and I study biology. Mm -hmm. I am involved in a variety of activities. So um, the biggest part of my week is crew. I am a varsity coxswain on the heavyweight men's team. And then he came back and did a start with providing one, year of inter one hour of intervention. I'm a undergrad student studying biology. I, I am currently a junior and so will be um, working a year after I graduated. And after one week, same okay. counselor. So I am a junior uh, studying biology and I am part of the crew team. I'm a constant on the heavyweight men's team. So what I do is I coordinate practices on the water and also I coordinate races. So I've called tactical moves. I'm the only person who is actually facing forward in the boat. So did anything change? Okay, somebody says expression. Anything else? Eye contact. Okay, so in terms of delivery, the language didn't change, but in terms of delivery, there was a lot of changes. So we're able to at least prime him to be able to change his behavior as he's interacting with the same counselor in one week period. Um, I'll show one other video, and this gentleman has a tendency to provide a longer answer, and then see how the avatar reacts to it. Why don't you start with providing some details about your professional background? I am a biological engineer major here at MIT. I taught for- Thanks for taking the time to tell me about your background. Emotional health is really, really important. It, 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 it's not just knowing what to do, it's basically being in conditions to do it. That has proved more challenging than just teaching a person, read this. Wow, that sounds very interesting. Thanks for taking the time to describe the situation. Let's move on to the next question. slander and just watch them slander her name so I had to stop them and talk thanks for your answer but it's been amazing because we've had a lot of success and that sounds like quite an experience Leslie why do you want to work for our company I feel that the opportunity wise I, there's a lot of a lot of space for Expansion, self-expansion, self-betterment, and I feel that I can take a lot from this experience. So he learned, was able to get this for your answer. And at the end, he wasn't upset or mad. It looks very real because like she nods and like she goes like this, and then she basically asks like a real person. So we identified sweet spot where technology could be honest with you and give you feedback. Imagine a human giving this feedback and interrupting repeatedly, that would not go well. So we saw that there might be an opportunity to design AI, even though it's not perfect, to be able to give you some feedback that might be beneficial for you, and you're able to reflect on it. So that was great. Um, and then MIT Tech Review ran a press article on this, and then I started to get a lot of emails from the general public, like, this is great, how do I use it? So I could not respond to all of them, so I set up a Google form so they say, please go fill out the form, and that was in 2013. And this is a screenshot, even 10 years down the road, people are still coming to the form and filling out that they would love this technology. So if you look at uh, the native language, there's a huge diversity. Uh, also, they're from all over the world. And if you look at the use case, it's also somebody wants to improve their presentation skills, to learn English, to improve, uh, to interview score worthiness, to help with interviewing and conversation skills. Um, some people have some difficulty with people uh, and many others. So you can see that there's a lot of use cases. And one thing that's evident that even though we have made a lot of progress in AI, we haven't been able to translate them into real use cases that's useful for a lot of people. And that's why people are still coming to the page, navigating through this Google form and sharing their story. So based on many of these entries, nearly 3,000, so we built a system called RockSpeak that was done in 2015 where anybody from any part of the world can go to a website, turn on the webcam, and practice giving a speech. And it's available today at rockspeak.com. So I usually give a live demo, but since I may not have time, so I had Eric try out 
a video and with this permission I can share what that feedback looks like. So that's him and we can play the video if you like. I know it's hard to watch your own video. All right, it's recording and it's a little overcast, a little cloudy today, but we were able to walk around the campus and we went into the library and uh, saw the beautiful architecture on campus, the law school. Um, we didn't go back and look at the stacks of books, but we did see a lot of... Uh, the Do you get the idea? And here, this is a word cloud of some of the words you said. Uh, he did said some of the filler words like but multiple times. Uh, I can look at visual features, see where he smiled. So purple line correspond to where he smiled. So it looks like there's a nice smile at the end. That's a nice way to end the speech. Uh, we can look at audio features. There is a nice fluctuation here. Uh, we can look at word alignment. We can look at um, word count and many other attributes, right? So, and uh, this was before GPT-3, so I can actually plug this in, the transcript, and put it into GPT-3 and tell me that, can you please say what he said in a uh, bullet form? It gives me a nice bullet. It can also rephrase that so that you know that what you can do better next time. So uh, this was before GPT-3. And then if he wants, again, this is machine generated feedback, but if he wants, you can click here and then share a link and share the video with people that he trusts. And people can take a look at the video and write comments. Uh, and those comments can appear here. So we don't have time to do that, but this is a rec pre-recorded one. And if you look at here, you can see that some of the comments appear here. You um, don't look very friendly if I come here. There's a lot of this people generating feedback and we know where it arrived and we can put it there. So it's a symbiosis of AI and machine working together where you get a sense of, okay, as people watch this video, how do they feel and what exactly I need to improve? And also, we can sort the feedback based on usefulness because if you share a video online, you can get a lot of not very useful content. So you can sort it based on ranking as well as sentiments. Ideally, you want to see some positive comment as well as some constructive comments. So you can do that automatically to sort the video and the data. So this has gone live in 2015 and more than 100,000 people have used it. And right now there are many even startups who are trying to do very similar um, technology. And then if you, now as I'm using PowerPoint, uh, there is a presenter coach that's available today. So if you go to office.com, there is view and then rehearse with coach. So, and it's built on the pattern that we have built. So as people give speeches, they could get live feedback uh, on whether they're using any filler words or even many non-inclusive words. And not only that, at the end, you get a summary feedback. Uh, in our research, we always promoted that a human performance shouldn't be narrowed down to a number, like four out of five, three out of five. We all are unique, and we have our own ways of doing things. And the purpose of the technology is to help you to be the best person you could be, given who you are. So the feedback should be designed for that versus trying to narrow everybody to a number and then do a leaderboard. So I'm glad to see that many of the existing technology that's there, they're using similar kind of feedback mechanism. Now, one good thing about academia is that we can go beyond building technology and really answer some questions. You can say that that's a really cute piece of technology, but does it really help people's soft skills? Can you show that scientifically? That's no question number one. And question number two, if that's the case, why and how that's helpful. So in the next few slides, I'll answer those two questions. So we designed an experiment wh where we had recruited online workers for 10 days. And we told them that every other day, you will have to upload a video using the framework that we have. And these are the prompts that we're gonna give you. So tell me about yourself and describe your biggest, biggest weakness and so on and so forth. And day 10, we have the same prompt again. And the reason because then we can compare from day one to day 10, same prompt, what really changed. And we built kind of like a Facebook-like interface when you log into a page and you see 
other people who also uploaded video and each of this experiment had 30 people. And there was a control condition where you would only see each other's video and we told them that you have to give feedback to at least three people, written feedback. That's the control. And for the treatment, you give each other feedback while also getting feedback from AI. It's a symbiosis of AI and human. So you have two conditions and then we want to see what's, is the performance changing through time? So here there are five prompts, five videos and Y axis correspond to my overall performance. And these are judged by independent judges. They had no idea uh, which one came from which group and what is the sequence of the video. So if you start plotting them, the treatment, which is in red, does better. In prompt three, they're same. In prompt four, the performance went down because I don't know if anybody remember question number four, it was about weakness, telling about the biggest challenge. It's a hard thing to do. And in prompt five, we see that treatment group has much better skills than the control group. And we run this experiment five times and we were able to replicate this every single time. So uh, we have this evidence that it, you know, it is indeed working. And we have this amazing set of data of online workers going through the intervention before and after. You see, and you see the stark difference. Uh, I don't have time to play the, all the videos, but I'll play one video. Hello, I first want to start off by saying that my name is Kira. I am a recent college graduate. I have a bachelor's of arts in communications with an emphasis in communication studies and public communications. So this was day one and this is day 10. A little bit about myself. I currently am an independent contractor for Amazon Mechanical Turk. Through this cloud-based platform, I've been able to do a wide variety of jobs. These jobs can include anything from data entry to transcription. So you see there is, there is some difference. Through some intervention, many of these people who are in Mechanical Turk were able to improve many of the delivery fairly quickly and robust way. So, okay, so we can do a check mark and we have a bunch of experiments to show that by designing the feedback using human and AI, we are indeed able to improve the performance. So the second question is, if people are really improving, how are they improving? What's really helping them, right? So can you get to that question and answer? So one thing we notice is that if you think about the 30 people, they're interacting with each other by writing comments. If you think about each person as a node and the fact that they're writing comments to each other becomes an edge. The entire thing becomes a network, right? It's a dynamic network. In a prompt one, they give feedback to three random people. That's the three edges. In prompt two, they give feedback to another three random people. So, and if you can express this as a network, the benefit is that I can, I can now go and use many of these tools from network science to understand what's going on underneath as people are interacting. So that was one good observation to be able to frame that interaction as a network. And once we did that, we had an hypothesis. We felt that it's not just the AI, the fact that people are also giving each other feedback, it's very, very critical. It's doing something, right? But that's a hypothesis, we have to test it, get some metric. So we said, okay, this is one person or all the people and the dots correspond to their performance from day one to day five, right? And what we wanna do is we wanna predict the final performance by looking at the trajectory of their previous performance. That's one condition. In other condition, we wanna do the same thing. This is one person, but we also wanna look at who are they interacting with, who are their peers and their performance and see by analyzing that, can I do a better job in predicting the final performance compared to this one? If this framework does better, that means who they're interacting with and their performance, it's doing something to the performance. So when you do a prediction, and this is error, so the lower the number is the better. So consensus is when we're using the network and network agnostic is when not using the network at all. So we consistently do better across six set of groups, which is 30 people each group. So when you use who their friends are and their performance, we can do a much better job in predicting the final performance. That means your peers matter. 
So if that's the case, we thought, okay, like maybe we can do a follow-up experiment where we're gonna have a static network. Previously, it was a dynamic network because every single prompt, I can just go randomly give comments to three people. And the next one, I find three new people. So it's dynamic, right? Here, we want to make sure your peers are fixed throughout the entire 10 days. So that means you have three set of peers and you in only interact with them. And this is what the network looks like, right? It's fixed. Everybody has three peers and they stay the same throughout the entire intervention. So five prompts, 10 days, and allow us to track and study the peer effects. So what do you find? Uh, we're able to replicate the same result. Like, dynamic as well as in static network, people do improve their speaking skills. And one thing that's really critical was access to better peer. If I get feedback from somebody who's better than me and the feedback is constructive, that elevates my performance. Also in this case, for example, I give somebody feedback, but you can come and click look at my video. So, and you can see, okay, I give you some feedback. Perhaps I'm doing that myself. So you can see how it's done. Empathy was critical because they're part of a network and they're showing empathy to each other. Uh, acknowledging progress and encouraging one another was very critical, something that AI cannot yet do. And diverse perspective and a sense of community safety and comfortable interaction experience. So at the end, it was just not about the AI itself, but AI enabling all that experience in a static network help people to get better. So let me show you some of this interaction of what it looks like. So these are two people interacting and the prompt was tell me about yourself. So this is an online worker. Hi, I'm Julius and I'm a former tech recruiter that's making the transition into web development. Here's a few highlights of my career. So we get that and then this is another person and she wrote a feedback that it's a bit unusual to stand in front of a computer, but if you can find a way to do it comfortably, I believe that will help you with the movement and gesture. And if you look at her video, that's exactly what you did. Hello. I have grown and expanded my own business with my husband for the past few years. And so that was the interaction. So let's see what happens in prompt two. So she, he tried exactly that. I would say my biggest weakness is that I'm a bit of a perfectionist at times. I'm very passionate about my work, um, but it's never been. A All right. So that's day two. And then in prompt four. So I was in a situation where I had to meet a challenge uh, with my leadership skills. Um, I was in my coding boot camp, and we were close to the end of it. Um, towards the end, they give you a group project that's actually a. You can see there, there's some improvement in terms of delivery from day one to where he was uh, through this interaction and things. And then the person came back and acknowledged the progress, like you're doing great with the appropriate gestures, really go as well. So uh, that kind of exchange was very critical. Let me give you one other example. So tell me about your greatest achievement. As I have said previously, I'm a stay-at-home mom. So basically, anything I talk about involves my kids. I don't do a lot outside of being a stay-at-home mom. So she rambles on and somebody says the sentence drops down in tone at the end of the sentence where you describe yourself as a stay-at-home mom almost like you're not impressed with yourself. Your pride in what you do, and it comes through later on the video, but started off good too. This is what you do, you do it well. Project it in your tone to convince us. And you see uh, what happens here. Conflict and leadership. Um, basically, what being a mom of four girls is all about. I don't know that there are many other houses that have as much conflict as ours with four girls one's just a baby so she doesn't have much conflict yet but oh but you get the idea she was able to use the same scenario same context but project it in a way that's a bit more positive and presentable and the same person came back and acknowledged the progress like you came out so confident in the beginning and i felt that throughout your video this is probably your strongest video yet from what i've seen so we have seen a many of this interaction that really helped them get better and then understand what to do to improve now we had some ideas about, you know, okay, it does help and the human element is very, very critical. 
Now the question is, if you can replicate this for public speaking, what other soft skills would you try it for, right? So this is a spectrum of different kind of uh, future of work. So it's obvious the one on the right extreme, right, that's probably going to be extinct in the future is unpredictable physical work. Any guess what that blue region is? What's gonna be in high end demand in the future? What kind of profession? Artist, okay, here artist, which means being creative, right? It's a creative work. So we thought, okay, if, if that's the important skill, is there a way to use similar idea to instigate people's creative abilities, right? So in the next few slides, I'll tell you about exactly how that went. But before I do that, let me just ask this question to you. How many, any guesses? Yeah. None? None? Why? It was no, all right? Okay, you are great. Uh, normally when I ask this question to a CS, they always get it wrong. And this, yeah, they're two, they're two types of animals uh, because they're very similar. But if I ask that question, Obama, then you would immediately understand the contrast, right? And the main reason is when I ask you to generate an idea, uh, your initial set of ideas will be very, very similar, like Noah, Moses. Uh, it will be very unlikely for you to use the ins entire brain the way you know, into all the corners of the brain to be able to come up with something very, very different. And the question is, is there a way to design an intervention for AI to nudge you so that you can use the, all the spectrums of your brain and be more creative, right? And what would that stimuli look like? What, how could you design that stimuli so that that helps you to be able to be more creative and study the entire spectrum of the ideas that you have? Um, so on an idea, anybody knows who this gentleman is? So he, his name is Jan LeCun. He got a Turing Award in computer science for his contributions to deep learning. So many folks in computer science would want to follow him, right? So to see what his ideas are, to take inspiration from him. And here, let's say somebody from your community, education science guru. And if you're a grad student, uh, ideally you want to be on the blue one. And the reason for that is you want to get stimuli. And especially if you want to build connection between computer science and education, you want to be right here. So you're able to take inspiration from education science guru as well as somebody who is a leading figure in computer science so you, you can combine your ideas. So for that, we said, okay, we wanna study creativity, but then how do you measure creativity, right? That's a loaded question. And one thing we tried was, you know, Goldford's alternate use cases where you're giving an object and you have to come up with a use case for this. So the obvious use case for pencil is writing, right? So that will not count. So it has to be something very, very different. And if you come up with something different, there's a way to give a score. So let me ask you a question. What would be an ultimate use case of pencil? Yes. A bridge for ants. I like that. It's, it's very, 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 um, somebody said bridge for ants. Yeah, it's very, very creative and unlikely. Anybody else? Yes. To restart a device, okay, like a handle. Yeah, that's a good one too. Uh, in our study, somebody said this, they're gonna use it as a, a score for kebab, which, is, which I thought was very creative. Let me try one more, shoe. What can they do with a shoe? Sorry? Flower pot, okay, sure. Prop a door with it, yeah, yeah these are good ideas. Uh, one of the participants said uh, they wanna have a house for Mickey Mouse. Somebody said they're gonna combine it and do this. So you see a lot of, when you start doing this thing, you see a lot of this creative ideas. And uh, this is my favorite example. What could you do with a key? Some creative, hmm? Sorry? Fork, okay. That would be difficult to you, but you could do that, yeah. Um, sorry? Okay, yeah, you could do that. Um, here, we, in the experiment, somebody said they're going to put it into HCL, and then from there, they're going to create a hydrogen and use that for cooking. 
so you get a sense of the test, right? So you're given an object and you're able to come up with the alternate use case and there is a way to give a score. I'll tell you how that is. So one score is non-redundant idea count. So let's say given a test, if other people have thought about the same idea, then it doesn't count, so it's eliminated. Y your idea has to be very distinct. Somebody hasn't talked about it, that's when you get it one point because it's non-distinctive. There is something called creativity quotient. That means given what you typed, you remove all the stop words, and then you feed it through a word net. That tells you where in the word net the words are. If they're far away from each other, that means they're very distinct and more likely to be creative. So using that, you can come up with a creativity quotient. And also you can rate them by humans. So these are three metrics we have defined to be able to find out how creative somebody's answer is. Uh, so what was the experiment? So we had, so we recruited some folks and we're given an object. They have to come up with a use case. And once that's there, uh, we have some alters. Let's call them, they are people that are pre-recorded. They've already given some responses, they're alters. And the folks who are participating, they're called egos. And we randomly pick two alters and show their response to the egos. That, you know, these are the two responses that I've gotten look at them and now generate new ideas. So there's stimuli. And once that's done, now we expose all the alters that we have and he can see, the participants can see all the alters. And then if he wants, he can rewire. That means instead of following these two people, I'm gonna follow somebody else. So in this experiment, you can follow two people. And right now he's following these two. But by looking at everybody else, if you wanna unfollow them and follow somebody else, you can and you just keep on doing this for five rounds, right? So that's the experiment. So we had multiple conditions. This is the dynamic condition where the red one are the alters, they're recorded already. The blue ones are the participants, and this is the initial condition where everybody has two alters they're following, and then we just wanna see what happens at the end of round five. Uh, you also have static condition where they don't have the option to rewire. So you're fixed with two alters and that's it. And third condition, the solar condition, we, we don't have any stimuli, right? Because that, that's the baseline. So as expected, this is where it starts. And by the time you finish, some people who are very, very creative ends up attracting a lot of followers, right? That's expected. So you and some people who are not very creative don't have a lot of followers. So it's kind of self-organizes the network. And when you run it multiple times with different alters and different egos, you see this kind of pattern. Like some people, were very creative, ends up attracting a lot of followers, and some people just don't. So that's what happens, but what does it mean? So from these three metrics we talked about, which is the creativity quotient, the alternate idea count, as well as the rating, people who have high performance attract more followers, and that's expected, that's great. Also, high performer inspire new ideas and egos. That means if I'm following, somebody who is high performer, following their idea makes me creative as well. That's also great, right? And we'd see that same thing across the two metric. Now in the next slide that what I'm about to show you is a surprising element. Uh, so if there's one thing you're gonna take from this slide, I'll take this one. Um, so not this one. So here, for example, you have my ideas versus your idea. So if, if I'm following somebody who has, who don't have a lot of ideas very similar, that's what it is. If I'm following somebody who is very distinct from me, then they don't overlap, so that means they instigate my ideas. This is the problem, but if all of us start following the same stimuli, then we start to introduce redundancy in our own idea. And that's exactly what happens here, right? So two common alters, that means if two people are following the same person, the creativity goes down through time. Uh, what does it mean? So at least for me, if I look at my peer group, look at who are they taking inspiration from, what are they working on? And I say, okay, I'm gonna go work on something else. Because if I try to do the same thing, the ideas will become very, very redundant. So you need to be able to go uh, take inspiration from some other sources that's not available in your own network. So that's exactly the summary on the paper that we have, that uh, performance is key for link formation. And following somebody creative can instigate your creative ideas, but Everybody else start to follow the same, start to take inspiration from the same source, uh, your idea could become redundant. 
Now, one good thing about the framework is that it's online and we can manipulate many things uh, that we cannot do in a real world setting. For example, here we said, okay, can we add some demographic information uh, to the idea? So previously there's no demographic information showed, it was just the idea, but now what if we start showing demographic information next to the idea, what happens? Uh, this is something you cannot do in real world because we all get to see each other. But during the pandemic, you saw that if you didn't know people, you would just rely on this, this image here to understand who this person is, their name, and perhaps who they are, right? Um, so in that scenario, having access to that information, how does that change your perception of the person and their idea? So here, same protocol, the control group the same as it is, you just get to see the idea here, we just add an avatar representing their gender as well as race and see what happens if, that, if that's available. Now there are two things that could happen. One is a new link could form. Like if I see somebody's demographic data, I can either break that link. I don't want to follow that person. I want to follow somebody else. So formation models means I'm going to form a new, new connection. So this would be it. Like here in this time T, I'm following these two people right now. I'm gonna break that, that's in red. Instead, I'm gonna follow somebody else. So your likelihood of staying with this person is called persistence. And the fact that you're gonna form a new connection is called a formation model. So we wanna predict, like given where you are, can I predict where you, you're willing to form a new connection? Or are you gonna persist with what you have? And we're only looking at three features. Uh, the alters, which is the stimuli, their performance, also the alters and egos race, and the egos gender and the alter gender, are they the same gender or not, the same race or not. So these are the three features. Using these three features, can we predict whether they're gonna continue to be following that person or break it? And if you can predict it, then we know that something in this is contributing to that. And what we see is that when you disclose the gender information, the fact that the same gender is gonna to continue to follow each other increases by 82%, which is a gender-based homophily. And here, in this result, it was flipped from what I showed. So by displaying the demographic data to people, their creativity, their creative ability went down compared to control group. So y-axis, correspond to cosine similarity in the idea. That means the similar they are, uh, the less creative you are. So it has to be this similar. So here in all these cases, the blue, that's the treatment group, that productivity, uh, their, the cosine similarity went up, whereas in control, they were less. And the only thing changed was just the demographic cue. So what that means is when people had, when like males, followed male, that just continued to form, whereas non-male, following non-male, that continued to persist regardless of the idea. And this is the same thing we see. If you take two ideas from male, um, there's a lot of redundancy. When you take two ideas from non-male, there's a lot of redundancy as well. So in summary, in this, in this case, what we see is that when the same gender links are highly stable across time, and this is something we can do that in that, and ideas are more homogeneous when there is a gender-based homophily. So diversity matters. So what is that implication? So especially in a place like School of Education, uh, we can probably have intelligent peer recommendation. Depending on who you are, we can recommend the appropriate set of peers. As a result, perhaps there may be more creative stimuli. One other thing that we tried, in addition to diversity, was playing around with popularity because the framework is there. Now we can go and change many things, maybe diversity and now maybe popularity. So one thing that we tried, which is a proxy for popularity, is the follower count. We felt that if somebody has more follower, they probably are more popular. So we had two conditions. One is the control, which is the same. So you see the ideas of your stimuli and that's it. And here you see the ideas, but you also see how many followers that person has, right? And our idea is that if you display that information, what happens to the creative outcome? So we had four different conditions. This is the control. 
where you don't show any popularity signal, it's just the default, you just see who they are and their feedback ideas. And here, this is the true signal. So these are very popular, they have a lot of followers. This is what it is. And this is where you do partial dispersion. That means if somebody is, has a lot of follower, we show them as not having a lot of follower. So we replace these two with these two. So they change, but they remain same. So people who are not very creative will leave it here, but then swap these two. And here, this is the extreme dispersion. We'll just swap them, right? So people who are very, very creative will go in this end and then the other one. And just by manipulating the popularity signal, we just wonder what happens to the creative outcome. Uh, when what we see is the manipulating follower counts does bias the connection patterns. People do seem to follow people who have a lot more followers, regardless of the idea. Uh, and one thing that's, that was very clear that the partial dispersion really helped. That means if, I, if somebody has a lot of followers, if you present it as not so popular, but somebody else who is not so popular as, as popular, that level of decentralization helps the creative outcome, which is this. And the extreme dispersion doesn't work very well. So what does it mean? Uh, perhaps one thing is for grants. Uh, for example, in, in the way that the grants are allocated, rich gets richer, somebody has a lot of money, continues to get a lot of money. Instead, perhaps there is a way to partially decentralize how the resources are allocated. Uh, there are many grad students here. You may have applied for NSF graduate fellowships. There is extreme criticism that many of the fellowship only go to a selective set of institutions, not everywhere else. There might be a way to make it a bit more equitable using a model like this. All right, so I'm gonna switch gear a little bit. So this was on the soft skill side of creativity. Now I'm gonna talk about improving maybe collaboration skills. Uh, many of you work in a team, and when you work in a team, you need to collaborate with each other. Um, anybody enjoys teamwork? Some of you. Teamwork is hard because you have, to, there's a lot of things you gotta do, and then the question is, how can you improve that teamwork, right? So we built a framework where, uh, this was before the pandemic, right? So we had to build, this was before Zoom, so we had to build an entire framework where four people are interacting, uh, and I'm gonna play this video, and there will be a quiz right after, so pay attention. Number three, I got the food. Number three. So they're talking about it. They played a game. It's called uh, Lost at Sea, where they pretended that you just ship. There was a shipwreck, and you were in an island, and you can only take ten items, and you have to sort what items are really critical for you to survive in that ship. And they're negotiating as to what those items might be. I got the food. I said the map. The um, um, constellate the stellar one. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had that one just below that one, so, hmm. uh -huh. what about you guys? Um, I had the two caliber pistols, but in <laughs> retrospect, <laughs> I don't think you probably encountered too many, like, Why would you, why would you hey, need a gun? <laughs> there might be those moon bears, you know. That's true. It's not to be vicious. You realize the only thing you'll be using it on is either blowing up your own allies' t oxygen tank or shooting them, right? That's true. Or you could. What can they tell about this interaction? Something obvious. Yes. Right. One of the participants didn't even participate, which happens a lot, right? So, and the question is, if that's the case, how do you kind of let them know, right? So, and also, how do you let others know that the other person is not participating so they also can include him appropriately? Because it's difficult to insert yourself in a conversation if you don't know how to. So we built a framework, it's called Collaboration Coach, where we build this video conferencing framework, extract data, extract a lot of this information and give feedback on participation. How often are you overlapping with each other? Um, what's the pattern of turn taking, valence, emotion? Who is sharing smile with each other? And share the data to see whether you can use that to influence the conversation dynamics. So this is overlap. This is one way you can give feedback and it's pretty obvious, right? So here you are overlapping, like the group is overlapping with eight times versus you are overlapping with the group four times. Um, we can also give feedback. You spoke after who, how many times. That creates a dynamic. Perhaps when you speak, somebody else starts to speak. Um, so this is just one example where you see that after one session, they would 
one person ends up dominating the conversation a lot. This is participation. These are four people. And then after giving them feedback on, hey, you know what, this is what's happening, it kind of become a bit more uh, democratic. So, on the, so we ran a full-blown experiment to show that by designing this kind of feedback, you're able to let people know that, you know what, you might be monologuing, it's time for you to back off, and without letting you know who's doing that, and you can start to see the conversation becomes a bit more um, balanced. For the interest of time, I want to sh sh tell you about one other project before I wrap up the talk, which is about end-of-life communication modeling. Uh, one question I have for you is that, uh, what percentage of final stage cancer patients leave doctor's office without understanding the prognosis? Any guess? 60, 60 okay. Anybody else? 60 is pretty close, 68%. And that, that is very unfortunate because these are the people who have the most pressing need for that information. If you're only gonna live a few months, you need to know that information to uh, know what kind of treatment is appropriate and, and consistent with the beliefs. And why is it difficult for doctors to do this? Because uh, this is a difficult conversation. I mean, they try to hint people, but often patients don't get it. Um, in fact, I'll show you two examples here. So let's read it. So this is Dr. A giving some information to a patient. And this is Dr. B. You can't read the full, but read what, what you have. Who do you think was rated better, Dr. A or Dr. B? A, I hear one vote for A. B, one vote for B, so it's, it's even for now. B, uh, two couple more for B, why B? Personal pronouns, yeah, you're right. So I think this is from a real transcript where you show that uh, how you speak matters, how you talk to the patient matters. And this is a part of the training where doctors are told to personalize and try to be as explicit as possible, yet it's very, very difficult. In fact, most of the medical schools have a program called Standardized Patient Program where there's a patient that plays the role of a, so there's an actor who plays the role of a patient and role plays with the doctor and gives them feedback at the end. And here, um, this is one model that exists in medical school, which is called empowered, explicit, and empathize with the doctor, with the patient. And there's a specific instructions as well. And if you work on language processing, you can immediately say this is something you can automate using today's technology. So uh, you can quantify what, is, what it means to empower, what it means to explicit, and what it means to empathize. So in the next slides, I will show you a video of, you'll see how those three pillars are changing. So hi, Julie. It's good to see you, and I'm sorry you're back in the hospital. You will see that these three pillars, they will continue to change. So how you see how the doctor empathize and explicit and empower. It'll so soon. I think I'm gonna need to be ventilated again. I'm afraid that might be right. I thought I was going to have more time. No, me too. I'm so sorry you're in this fix again, Julie. I, I'm going to be straight with you, okay? It, it, it's possible that even with a ventilator, this is progressing, you'll get sicker and you won't be able to come off the ventilator, and it's possible you'll die despite the ventilator. We've taken our time with long conversations, and Julie, I've got to tell you, I'm feeling some pressure because of time. And I don't want to cut this short. I really don't, given what's going on, mm -hmm. given this uncertainty ahead. What matters to you? What are you hoping for here? As much time as I can get. I'm interpreting that to mean if you need a ventilator, if you can't breathe without it, 
you would want us to put you on the ventilator mm -hmm. with the hope that you will survive that. Yes. Yeah? Okay. How many of you think she was a real patient? She was a, she was an actor. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't have permission to share this video if she was a real patient. So this is a uh, standardized patient that's, uh, that teaches you about how to really do this. And he's one of the doctors in her hospital. He's a master at this. Not Your average doctor is not as good. So th this, this is how they teach communication in medical school. And our job was, you know, the, some folks in the medical center told us that the standardized patient cost a lot of money. Also, you cannot find standardized patient that covers a wide variety of demographics as well as situation. So uh, the doctor should be able to practice across many different people, different age group, and you can do that with standardized patient. So the task is, can AI play the role of the virtual patient and carry on the conversation and can give you feedback. So I will, in the next slide, I'll play a video where we use chat GPT to be able to drive that conversation and with the doctor. So it's creepy if, if you can't work with a standardized patient, you should do that, but this is uh, designed to be an older patient. Hi, doctor. I'm meeting with you today to help get some questions answered about my condition. I'm really concerned about why my pain has been getting worse recently. So everybody used chat GPT, right? So here the prompt was that this is a final stage cancer patient and her pain is getting worse and the medication is not working. So given that prompt, chat GPT came up with a dialogue that she's uttering. So you give the prompt, given the situation, and then it drives the conversation. So this prompt, if she has cancer, pain is getting worse, medication isn't working. Based on that, that's exactly what she said. I haven't really been able to get any relief from the medication I'm taking. Do you have any idea why that might be? Can you tell me where you're having pain? I'm having pain in my chest and it's been getting worse. I'm really scared about my condition and how it might progress in the future. Again, these are the prompts that are going into chat GPT and chat GPT is generating the utterances that she's saying. Yes, I think it would be important to talk about your cancer. So here something happened, right? So the system decided that doctor wasn't showing empathy because she just talked about pain and then doctor didn't acknowledge, I'm sorry that here that you're going through pain. So it recognizes lack of empathy and that's now gonna go to the system and now it's gonna escalate. She's gonna put a lot more pressure on the doctor because she did not sense empathy. And that's how this will continue to escalate if the doctor doesn't mitigate it. You don't understand how hard this is for me. I just don't have the energy to fight this anymore. I'm very sorry to hear that, Sophie. That must be really a difficult thing to go through. Now the system recognizes that it's empathy, so this is gonna de-escalate. I'm still trying to understand what my test results mean. Can you explain what they mean for me and my treatment plan? Yes, yeah, Sophie, the hard news to hear is that your cancer has spread. Oh no, I can't believe it. I'm so scared, doctor. What can I do now? Yeah, I can imagine that just this must be very scary and I'm happy to talk about what we should do next. Thank you for being so understanding and caring. It means a lot to me. Well, it's my pleasure and I'm happy to do whatever we can to help you. Let's pause here for feedback on this conversation. So there are different modules. This was on empathy. There is a module for explicit. There are modules for other things as well. And it doesn't really have to be about patient doctor conversation. It could be about anything where you can, for given a scenario, carry on the conversation you can recognize whether the person is doing appropriately or not and use that to either de-escalate or escalate the conversation. So this is an ongoing study where we uh, ran a pilot study and showed that by give, designing this kind of feedback, we're able to improve doctor's performance. So this was the interaction. Once you're done with the interaction, you would get a feedback kind of like this. 
So here, they're supposed to follow a model called MVP. That means when they talk, they want to talk about medical situation, the values, and plan. We can look at the transcript, and using topic modeling, we can automatically decide how long the doctor has spent talking about those three conditions. Uh, we can also look at empower, try to quantify it, what it really means to empower the patient. We can automatically find out how many questions the doctor asked and how many of them are open-ended questions. The open-ended questions are good because that allows the patient to open up to provide a lot of responses and questions. Uh, we can also quantify empathy. We can look at the use of personal pronouns. There's an empathy word cloud that's exists in the literature. We can measure an average score for empathy. Uh, we can also quantify explicit. So these are the hedge words the doctor might have said which could be confusing. We can also quantify speaking rate, how fast the doctor is speaking, and we can also quantify the reading level of the doctor if they're speaking. I mean, in this case, he was speaking in ninth grade level versus, I don't know, college. So we can quantify this, a doctor can take a look. And also on the left, you have um, the entire transcript. So here, you can see it flagged it, that if I click here, this tells a missed opportunity. Like I could have asked, how much information do you want about your prognosis? What concerns you for more for the future? So doctor can say, you know what, this is where I could have asked this question, but I didn't. So you can go and look at that. You know, you know, this was a missed opportunity. I could have asked a bit more questions to probe more about the patient. So we ran one pilot study with 20 doctors to sh with this kind of feedback and showed that by giving this kind of feedback, you were able to improve at least the way you're being perceived uh, by as expert as to how empathy or how explicit you are. And we're in the process of running a clinical trial to see whether this kind of feedback could be valuable for the physician to retain their skills. All right, well, I'm almost in the end of my talk, so I just want to end with um, a diagram that I have. Uh, this is something I borrowed from a diagram called Turing Trap. And if you look at the black ones, this is what AI can do. And the white circle is what humans can do. Right now, there is an unusual competition to expand this white black circle to overlap with the white circle as much as you can. I think that's a wrong way of looking at things. Instead, there's a lot of things that humans can yet do, and maybe with the help of AI, Perhaps we can venture out here and do those things. And I think that's where there's a lot of opportunities to use latest technology. So latest technology to be able to think about how can they do some of the things that you wanted to do, but you can't, but now you can. So I think that would be one way to look at AI and what's happening into the future. On that note, I would like to acknowledge my group who does all the work, and I have the pleasure of being here and, and channel all the work we do as a group. And on that note, I'll turn it around and open the floor for questions. Um, thank you so much for this talk, Asan. Um, we're going to do the Q&A just by raising your hand and we'll pass the mic. Um, I'm gonna have the mic a lot because I'm going to be voicing questions from our virtual um, audience. Um, so our first question is, um, there's clearly a lot of benefits to using AI to um, help people train different kind of conversation styles, um, but what are maybe possible effects to um, having people get used to speaking with AI and not perhaps to um, real people? That's a valid concern, and, and in other ways, it could be easier for them to do well with the AI, with a virtual character, but not with a real person. So how does that skill translate? So. All the experiments that we ran, it was really about AI being an intervention, while there is a pre and post where, let's say with the experiment of job interview, there was this initial case where the student will interact with the, with the counselor, and then they would come back, interact with the AI, and come back again and interact with the counselor. And we look at before and after to see, as you interact with the counselor in between AI, is there something that's changing? So we design it that way so it's more of like a training tool versus a friend. If you frame it as a friend, companion, then the dynamics change. But if it's a training tool, an intervention for you to improve your skills to go out in the real world, 
then it's a very different scenario. Yes. Maybe you want to repeat that question for the audience. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, is there any scholarship that compares the effectiveness of AI intervention tools versus human to human intervention? So kind of comparing the advantages and disadvantages of each method. Right, I think if you can, human to human interaction is a lot more powerful. I think if you, if I have the option, that's the intervention I'll go for. Uh, but often we are constrained with resources, right? So for example, with autism, I, I told you about my brother. He gets speech therapy only uh, once a week, only 30 minutes, and that's it. I would want him to get more speech therapy, but everybody else would do the same thing. But there's only two speech therapists in the entire school, so they can scale. So ideally, if there are n number of speech therapists, I don't want to go for AI. I want humans to be able to provide this training and then go that way. But the fact that resources are constrained, we are now relying on, okay, if you can have a real therapist, which is the best case scenario, what's the next level we can have? And, and, and hopefully that not be replacing, but supplementing it. For example, my mom brother can now practice speech therapy from home using AI and he can share the data with the therapist. The therapist can take a look at the progress and then when he meet, they can see, okay, what's going on. So it's supplementing it at home, additional practice time. Um, so my opinion is if, if you have enough resources, human should be the way to go. I mean, anything with job interviewing, with end of life care, uh, with doctor, they should be human. But if you don't have that resource and you don't think you're gonna have it, especially if equity is a thing, like when other countries, they don't have anything, maybe there, there is a way to use AI to bootstrap it and give access to everybody. I hadn't thought about that, about it making more therapy and these issues more accessible. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. It's always strange to hear one's own voice. Thank you for the talk. Um, I came in a little bit late, so um, I'm sorry if you've already answered that question. Uh, but at some point you were talking about the improvement, and I think that there was an assumption that the improvement um, was a straight line, that it was you know, linear. Um, what that got me to think is whether um, by bootstrapping um, artificial intelligence in these processes, uh, whether we would be able to um, improve on that improvement curve vis-a-vis -vis human interventions. And if so, um, I, would you be able to comment on that? I don't know if you, you know, have any intuition or perhaps there is some you know, research that your group has done on that, because that would be really interesting to see if you know, machines could not do as well as humans, but also you know, maybe do even better, not by just the sheer brute force of repeated sort of interventions. So what I, the way I answer the question is, as you're doing the intervention, the machine can understand where they need the help and provide the help as they need it? That would be one way to do it, yeah, to operationalize it. So we looked at it from a, f but for a different project. So I'll, I'll tell you about the project. This is about measuring the severity of Parkinson disease. So if you have Parkinson disease, it's, let's say it's an involuntary tremor of your body. And for that, you have to go to a clinic and perform a set of neurological tests in front of a doctor. We have a tool where now you can do this from home and we can quantify the tremor, right? And it's important to quantify the tremor because based on that, the doctor can fine tune the dosage. Mm -hmm. So if you do this on every day at 10 a.m., then now we have a very consistent set of data point and that's really critical because Parkinson doesn't have a cure. Fine tuning the dosage is the way to go, mm -hmm. right? And what we are hoping is that 
maybe at some point, if you can do this n number of times, we can automatically bootstrap and find out what kind of dosage you want, how well you're responding. The f entire thing becomes fully automated, mm. right? So right now, you go to a clinic after four months. It's just too late uh, mm. for doctors to get that fine-tuned data and fine-tune the dosage, right? Um, so if you can, if it's in a computer, I'm performing the task in front of a computer maybe multiple times a day. Computers get a sense of how well I'm responding to the medication before mm -hmm. and after, day in and day out, and they can automatically find, they will be in a better position than a doctor mm -hmm. to recommend the dosage amount. And that would be one way to kind of improve that cycle in which you interact with a computer. Okay, like and that's just one example. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, one, a conversation I had uh, when we started, um, one theme that came up was something you raised as well, which is uh, machines, you know, AI replacing humans. Yeah, so in an economy, profit margin driven um, society, uh, I heard you say that you, you know, one way, a different way to look at it is to see how AI could actually help. Um, people and the, the training aspect is really good. Um, how do you, is that, is that a smaller group of people and how do, how do you grow that um, uh, to a majority where, you know, AI is, is here to help people, not replace people? <laughs> I mean, I followed my intellectual curiosity, so that's how I land into it. And it's hard to publish this kind of work when it's not mainstream, right? So people want to see the benchmark of the algorithm compared to what others have. And when you have designed an algorithm, then try to run an intervention, try to show progress, it's just hard to do that kind of work and get funding for it. So it's, it's, it's harder in general. And also you need to have appetite for wearing multiple hats, right? So you got to build the build the technology, be the engineer, then design the experiment and then build infrastructure to support the experiment, do the analysis, um, do IRB, recruit people, right? It, it's just a lot of lot to ask from individual. Um, so that, that's, it's hard. And also then once you publish it, then nobody wants to take it, right? What, what, you know, it becomes, nobody's, like nobody wants to take this kind of work, right? So it's just a, I um, mean, machine learning says there's not, 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 not enough machine learning. If you go to medicine, it's not hardcore medicine. If I go to, I don't know, uh, uh, education, they said not enough education. So it, there is that aspect as well. Like as researcher, we wanna get things published rather quickly. And that drives the kind of problem we take. Um, I mean, in, in our case, if you can take this work as a mission, like I don't care about publication, I don't care about recognition. I just wanna push it forward to see how well you can push because I know people who could benefit from it. Once you start making this connection, then it becomes a bit more liberating to pursue it because uh, I don't care if you get rejected n number of times, as long as I, I see an impact on it. And also partnership is critical. Like there is no way I can do all this work on my own. So we had amazing set of collaborators, right? So with a job interview, we worked with a career center, uh, the counselors, we work with ETS. Uh, when you work with collaboration, we work with our business school. Uh, we sometimes work with the School of Education um, to learn more about the theory. So when you work with me me uh, Parkinson's disease, that was with medical centers, neurologists. So you need to have, grow that network, find the right set of people who can make it easy for you to do that work. Um, Thank you for taking a more noble approach. Uh, I have another question from the online audience. Um, this is about a very specific point in your presentation around slide 89, uh, they say, um, specifically about creativity and social networks. Um, and they're asking if we add, uh, or if we have more alters and more rounds, uh, not five or six, for example, will it provide different findings? So we had how many alters? Um Right, so we, we cr if you had, I mean, we used, uh, so the question is if you vary the network size, what would happen, right? Mm -hmm. Can't, um, I mean, we could, we could try many different length of the size, and I think we might have tried that. I mean, at some point, we want to be cons consistent across all the trials. So we were able to show that at least 
result from one trial to the next are comparable. Uh, I think if you try different length for alters, um, I'm not sure what would happen. I mean, that's to be tested. I think for our case, this is the arbitrary number we came up with and we ran a bunch of pilot study and that seemed like a right size for network. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of them, then it becomes a very, first of all, it becomes, we need to have a lot more participants as well to, to do this. It's the complexity of the network becomes large. So that requires more resources. That's one thing. If you have too small, you may not see the effect. So for our case, that size was the perfect for us to see the dynamics while it's manageable. So that was the decision for the numbers we chose. Great, thank you. Hello, Dr. Hoke. Um, I'm doing some research in effective computing and language learning. And I just had some questions about how, or any ideas that you have about how we could take everything that you've done with your conversation coaches and apply in the world of language education, English language learning for foreign learners. Yeah, I mean, all the stuff we talked about, empathy, acknowledging progress, yeah. um, showing how it's done, and all the skills would generalize to language learning as well. Um, I think how we display the features, the feedback to the participants will have to be different because the features are very different, but the principles of how you're sensing some of that information and how you are giving that feedback. At the end, it's not just about seeing all the data. I want to be able to get feedback from a real human. So I was telling Eric that I was learning a new language recently and I downloaded Duolingo and I hated it, mainly because I just no real person feedback. I want to be able to talk to a person. And now I am learning the same language online with multiple people and an instructor and an odd time and they're in a different country, but I like that interaction, feedback, being accountable, compare notes, see how we all are struggling on one topic. That means it's probably justified, it's really tough. I think that sense of belonging is really critical. So if we can emulate some of that while integrating technology so I can see how I'm making progress, uh, what I need help with, I can visualize things so it adds a bit more visual element to my learning. I think bringing all of that together would be really, really useful. Yes. Yes, uh, so I've got a question about the, like in the second language acquisition field. So, um, I actually found some learners, when they achieve the median language proficiency, they start to, like, they start to concerns about how to achieve the higher level, because um, there's no enough language exposure to those students, so they couldn't just um, talk to uh, native speakers or communicate the target language in their real life, so that's a situation they didn't really get enough resource, learning resource, so I think um, for their scenarios, um, machine learning could help. So, um, so the main question, the main problem they have to deal with is, is to find out the learning object, but they don't really know which learning object should, they should choose to learn to um, like facilitate their language learning. So would you say like gathering the language data, all the gathering all the language learning object would be helpful for them to, um, for, for them to de uh, determine their like the following learning targets or would you say like um, another option or another approach would be helpful for them to like decide their learning object, like learning goal. Learning objective you mean, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to understand the questions. You are understanding that different, different people, different learning ob objective, right? Yes. So um, I think for them, they couldn't just decide what, what they want to learn to access the native le level of speaking. So um, um, I guess it's hard for them because they don't get enough of exposure. And also like if you want to get enough exposure, it takes time. So um, our educators want to save the time for the students. Um, so what would you recommend we do like to use machine or computer to help them to facilitate the learning progress to get to the point they want. 
since they don't really know what points they want. <laughs> it's really confusing, but um, I guess most of the learner, they take time to find what target they want to achieve, but uh, it really takes time, especially learning a language. Yeah, I'm learning a new language. I'm struggling right. with that myself. And I'm not an expert in language learn learning, so uh, you should take my words with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if they're unsure of learning objective, perhaps even having some baseline conversation uh, would be understand. Just having a casual conversation to see what things are, what, and from there recommending something uh, would be one way to do this. Uh, for example, when I uh, so I was shopping for learn different software for learning language, and most of them want to know where what do you want to do like what's the objective mm -hmm. uh, and if i'm unsure then they can ask me some questions like you know was, you know what, what do you want to do and can, sometimes you can implicitly ask some questions to get to the objective until this is what you think so maybe there might be a way to implicitly ask some questions or learn about learn more about them to recommend right. a strategy and if they don't want it, they can say, no, I don't want it. You can start it over again, but you might, if, they, if that's what you want, then you have a way forward. Right. Yeah, I actually think that solution might be helpful, like the conversation, using conversation and get to the point through conversation would be really helpful. Right, I mean, f I mean, one thing, I mean, in the da dating uh, literature, that's exactly what they do. Many people will go to dating websites. They don't like to fill out all these forms, right? right? So often there's a lot of research done then, you know, just buying, typing something, having a conversation, can you infer about what exactly am I looking for? Because many people don't know what they're looking for. They're just looking for a partner, but what characteristics, what, if they haven't thought it through, they're open, right? So th I think looking into that literature might be helpful as well, and then maybe leveraging some of that. Thank you so much. Hello, Dr. Hulk. Uh, so I have two questions actually. So first of all, I watched your uh, Dr. AI uh, conversation and I wonder if you, your team um, intentionally designed the AI figure to the extent that it doesn't look real to avoid something like the uncanny valley or uh, is it just the best we can do currently? The one that I showed, that's the best Ex we can do. That, that's the best that, you can do, okay. That's from MetaHuman, okay. that's a website, that's the state of the art. Okay, so, uh, and my following question is actually, so um, if, if uh, the figure becomes really like too real, are you, and you, we're saying that it should be treated as a tool, not a companion, how do we draw the line? And uh, because I know that people can get attracted by the, just, just, just the voice, and it doesn't have to be a figure, so. And then um, once it's really well developed, I assume that um, maybe even me, I, treat, I, I can take the AI as like a, mistakenly as a companion. So in that case, should the, are, are you looking, are you focusing on, well, a non-human-like figure? in the future, or it will be just the, the best, try to do the best? Right, it's a great question, and you're right, we, we should be worried about if what it becomes really, really real, what happens? What should the future look like? Uh, and we don't know yet, but in the past, and some people have purposefully used a cartoon-like character just to be able to dampen your expectations right away. Because when you see a real human, and it's static and doing this, uh, you hit the uncanny valley, right? If you just use a 2D character, maybe something that's dumb, but it at least functions as a conversation partner, then the expectation is lowered right away and you focus really on the feedback. Uh, and that's exactly what we do on the job interviewing coach, Mark. Uh, I was mentioning some of this, I mean, you were there, right? Uh, I don't know whether you were there, so I talk, I was mentioning that um, with the mock system, it was as it's interacting with students as a recruiter, it would nod its head in every four seconds, randomly, right? And many students at the end, when you debriefed with them, they're like, wow, this person, this character is really intelligent because it was recognizing that I made a point, it was nodding its head appropriately. So they're projecting that behavior as intelligence. So there's a lot of things you can play around uh, with imperfect technology for the conversation to move on, at the end, focus on the feedback. Okay, so if we're trying to make, um, well, 
thank you for the feedback. So, we tr so in a way, we can we can design like a cartoon figure to make to avoid creating real figures. But we also try to make a real conversations between the patient and doctor. So, to me, it seems that um, that gives a, that provides opportunity for the doctors to actually game the system. Maybe, what's your opinion? Game the system by just by um, providing the appropriate um, like the conversation or feedback. So they don't have, while well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's they talk, uh, they, they, they form like a produce specific, specific, um, certain ways to talk with the AI while they can't really apply it to like in the, in the real conversation with the patient. Right, so I think in, in this experiment, we have very similar design that they would mm -hmm. interact with a standardized patient first and standardized patient, the real person will rate them and the doctor will interact with the AI and then go back and interact with the standardized patient again. So at the end, we're looking at the doctor's performance with a real human before and after. And the standardized patient is giving the feedback. So, so it's really the translation of the exercise of the AI into a real world to see whether that's changing. So it's important to have that element in your design when they do that to avoid this criticism because everybody will ask, like you're building this cute tool to do X, Y, and Z, but how do you know it's generalizing? That's the golden question in this kind of work. Hi, Dr. Ha. Uh, first of all, great talk. Thank you so much. And I'm curious about your last study where you have a doctor interacting with a computer. And I think that design can also apply to us as language teachers as well, except that I have one concern. Because for most language teachers, we are not facing one student. In most cases, we are facing more than one sometimes even more than 20, 30 students. So I'm wondering whether the current technology would allow us to have um, interactions with 30 or not that much with 10 or more than one um, students through AI. Would that be allowed? Well, of course it will be allowed. I think, I think the design <laughs> will be very different. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. But I mean, whether the current um, technology would you know, allow that to happen. So let's say, let's try to dig deeper. It would it be a Zoom conversation or face to face? Um, I think it doesn't really matter whether it's Zoom or face to face, but it would have different meanings. But let's say on Zoom. Right, so let's say if it's in Zoom, if there are 10 people and you only have one teacher and you need yeah. to, and what's the purpose? You wanna be able to engage with all of them, right? Uh, that can be one purpose or to try to provide feedback in a correct way, like corrective feedback, positive feedback, or build rapport with students, like for different purposes, like um, how, how we see in that video where you, you have different purposes for doctors as well, whether to show empathy or build, uh, whether to show empowerment. But for teachers, I think there are also different purposes. But um, my main question is, I'm just curious whether we can have like multiple um, conversation agents. But so um, if I understand the Zoom, there will be AI driven agent talking to 10 people at the same time? I think teacher talking to 10. So, and you wanna know how AI could be useful here? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, what's the, what's the difficulties you're facing right now as a teacher engaging with 10 people? Uh, I, I'm just curious whether there is um, difficulty in involving 10 AI simultaneously interacting with one human teacher. Do I make myself clear? So I'm a teacher, I'm talking to, there are 10 people in Zoom room and you wanna have yeah. 10 different AI talking to each student? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean that, you know, it's just an, 10 different instantiation of the same, same problem. And right? they can work simultaneously sure. and those AI can interact with each other as well? I think theoretically, yes. I mean, that oh. all sounds possible. You could have maybe, maybe a breakout room, right? So where you, an AI and the human can go and have a conversation and then if it's a software agent, they can all could interact with each other to see how well things are working. And the teacher can get to see, okay, there are 10 rooms here, mm -hmm. how things are going, which room needs more attention, and what kind of attention do they need? And they can probably interact with the AI to provide that kind of nudging. So yeah, the yeah. AI knows how to move along. So that way, a teacher could be managing the AI, and the AI is managing the students. Oh, yeah. Wow, that, that's really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you for showing so much feedback effects in different contexts and in different samples. I'm interested if you could elaborate if there is the feedback works for some people different than for others. So have you may in your found in your large samples and context some patterns that yeah, some students profit more, maybe the stronger, maybe the not so stronger. What individual differences did you find? All right, so um, that's a great question. I mean, often when you try to do, do this kind of work, we're gonna recruit a lot of people to show statistical uh, significance and then when you do that, you actually miss a lot of people who may not be improving, something is there. Uh, we have done a lot of work with autism where there's a saying that if you know a person with autism, you know one person with autism because there's a huge variability. Uh, in that case, for example, we built a speech-driven system for speech therapy with folks with autism, right? And in this case, uh, we built a game where uh, you have to interact with the teacher and there's a game and the game there is a character that you like maybe a car and the car moves along if you're speaking appropriately so it's looking at your speaking patterns maybe pausing appropriately making speaking rate if you're doing things appropriately you can see the game is moving and what we saw is that some people have different preference for different kind of game so we used this on a scratch so you can rapidly customize the game somebody likes animals let's say so the object could become an animal Somebody likes fruits, so the object could rapidly become a fruit. So rapid customization was the one way to be able to make sure that everybody is engaged and making progress. Uh, but um, so that was one example of um, rapidly customizing things to make sure everything works well for everybody. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for a wonderful talk. It was very engaging. I have no background in this area, but I learned a lot today and now I'm very curious. Um, I know we talked a little bit earlier about uh, my field of discourse analysis and conversation analysis. And I was curious, you talk about working with other partners, medical partners and so on. Um, I think there's a huge body of research around, especially just palliative care, end of life care, for example, and discourse analysis. And I wonder if any of your research is informed by that or if you could maybe you know, include some of this, um, especially I'm thinking about empathy and all of these things. It's, I think it's hard to quantify that sometimes, but a lot of this qualitative work perhaps could inform that. And I'm just curious if you have any, any, um, yeah, partners or any other research like that, discourse analysis or so on that you have built upon. Right, the stuff that I showed at end of li life care that was um, with an NIH grant, our PI was Ron Epstein, who is a oncologist. So he collected 400 of these conversations between doctors and patient. And that was all manually labeled and, and we learned a lot about discourse, empathy. So based on a huge body of literature that he has published, we went about, okay, if you take that, how do you go about quantifying it? And the mapping is often not trivial. Uh, often you have to make some interpolations. For example, empathy, how do you even quantify empathy? I mean, there are many ways I can empathize. Uh, sometimes I can just empathize by not saying anything, just looking at you, right? And, and there's a huge variation as well in terms of how we empathize. So it, it's just not possible to capture the rich set of empathy with some metrics. So we had to make some trade-offs, like what are the things that we can measure reliably and that will be consistent and will be a good proxy for empathy. So that's how we mapped from what we know with the existing literature into some kind of quantification of this metric. And this is uh, just a first start. I'm sure we'll continue to make progress and make things better. Thank you very much. Um, so following up on that question, um, this data, or this question is a lot about um, data. Um, so this person asks uh, or says, in Parkinson's and the field of autism, data is a major issue. Um, we don't get into a lot of subjects for a long period of time. There's little data. Um, diversity is also missing. Um, so we're struggling in this domain to find smart approaches to convince all. Um, and they're wondering if you could comment on this um, and possibly any solutions that you know of. Yeah, everybody's struggling with it. Uh, in fact, in AI, at the end, it's not about the technique, it's really about the data. Whoever has the data controls everything. Um, it's it just what it is. So you just have to invest a lot of time with, with data, and that's exactly what we do. 
I know I didn't talk about Parkinson disease research, but we started this in 2015. In fact, we built a page. Um, if you go to park test, or, and I'm just gonna show it here. This is a page that we built that allows anybody from any part of the world go to a website, turn on the webcam, and perform the set of neurological tests that you, did, you would do in a clinic, but now you can do this using a browser. So just making it deployed, we're able to rapidly collect data from all over the world and get also the representation that we want. But again, building this framework required a lot of time and effort. And imagine when you're building something for an older population, many of them can only use the space bar and that's it. How would they go about navigating a page and perform this test? So it's, it's not trivial. And also the quality of the data. When we ask people to do this in, from home, the quality is all over the place. So there's a lot of challenge, but if you can push it through, for example, with Parkinson disease for the last six years, we have pushed it through and then now we have the largest data ever collected on this disease. Now we are a giraffe uh, in the garden. That means everything is low hanging fruit for us because we have the data. We've spent many years collecting it. Now we can do the interesting stuff. Um, so the, my advice is to have a long-term vision. Uh, don't go for the paper that I need to publish next year versus, okay, where do you need to go five, 10 years down the road? And how do we go about collecting the data and doing the work? Uh, it's just worth it. Great, thank you. So, um, so first of all, thank you, Dr. Haas. This is a very amazing speech. And um, I have a question regarding the combination of social skills and language learning. So I think one of the very important uh, feature of learning a language is to learn the uh, how to cater your speech, your talking catering to different audiences. So you talk to different people with different registers in different situations. So this is the social skills that you probably language learners need to learn. And uh, so regarding AI, I'm wondering uh, it could be able to uh, in recognize and interpret humans facial expressions and gestures and these are now linguistic features but it's also convey meanings while you speak and uh, so I'm thinking maybe in the future probably right now I don't know whether right now technology has this or not but maybe in the future AI could lead to a stage that uh, I could teach uh, Second language, second language learners to improve their social skills in linguistics. But uh, so my question is, right now, at what stage the technology could realize this? And also, what is the difficulty when, if, if I want to build an AI that teach uh, second language learners to improve their social skills in linguistics? I think people who are learning second language, all you have, I mean, you, you can't assume that they need social skills training, right? So they may, I mean, just because they're learning second language. So I, I would say like learning social skills, like how to respond to um, inter, like another speaker is a higher level thing. I think you, you, you might be asking is there is way to build tool to learn more about cultural no norms, yeah, yeah. Uh, the differences. Like for example, if I have to go somewhere, some country and they're very different from each other, how do I go about respecting mm -hmm. their culture, integrate? Uh, there's a lot of work done when, um, during the Iraq war, um, when you know they want to know when the soldier goes to Iraq, how would you go about greeting people, mm -hmm. uh, not appear threatening, uh, respect their culture, have a good conversation. There's a lot of literature exists on that domain. So you might be able to draw on that to learn more about culture and norm, how it violated and what are the training uh, that's done. So there is that. Um, so can AI be coded with all of these features and they need to know how to respond to um, people or how to respond in different situations? I don't think there is something exists that's universal just yet, but if you can give some prior information, let's say you are going to the Middle East and then there are Muslim Muslims over there and then 
given that, how should you go about greeting people? How should mm -hmm. you go about shaking people's hand? I mean, there is a lot of this information uh, that may be collected. So I m imagine maybe in the future you can say, hey, I'm going to this region. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a training experience for me to see how do I go about tr uh, yeah. um, greeting somebody? I think that should be f doable. Yeah, and also, uh, so one thing is uh, the AI could understand, could interpret the humans, like uh, non-linguistic features, like facial expressions, gestures, something. And can AI also itself has the social intelligence that let the human understand the AI's like facial expressions and uh, gestures? Can AI be acted like a human? Maybe sometime in the future, but I think um, right now it's uh, right now. I think it's going back to the question the gentleman asked. Mm -hmm. That's not a priority, at least for me. Okay. Uh, I want to build AI that's more on training to help us to be better. Um, building AI that's more sentient and that will have the same kind of expression. It might be something that could happen in the future, but not something that. Um, I am prioritizing at this moment, but I think there's a lot of literature done on synthesis. Like so if there is an AI, what should the synthesis of the behavior be non-verbally? What should be the alignment of facial expression, prosody? So there's a lot of work done. So imagine we'll see a lot more of this natural conversation. For example, in the avatar that we showed is kind of rigid. Hi, hello doctor, I'm here. It's, it's unnatural. Yeah. So we may see a lot of this improvement, like hello doctor, I'm here. So some of the naturally, yes. spontaneously uh, happening behavior. So w I think there's a lot more to do there and we'll see that happen in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, hi, Professor Ho. Um, so I have a question about sign language. Um, so based on the question my, um, my friends ask, um, so she mentioned that um, she she want to see if AI can be used for gestures or facial rec uh, rec facial expression recognition, and uh, I, I feel like a lot of those things are embedded in the sign language. And uh, what's the current status of using AI technology to automatically translate or maybe just um, um, making a transcript of the sign, uh, sign language? So it's a good question. I don't work on that sign language project, so my knowledge might not be up to date. But I've seen some projects from Microsoft where using Connect, you were able to, let's say, assign somebody s saying something um, from speech. They could translate that into, and then have an avatar play the sign language. So I think that kind of work has, I've seen examples of that. So I think we'll see more of that, like from speech okay. to an agent who can take my speech as an input and sign it appropriately or respond to it um, appropriately using sign language. Thank you so much. So uh, my second question is about like the algorithm used in the field right now, but the, actually the first question, the first solution to my question, uh, that's really helpful. Sometimes the teachers just forgot how to uh, access the question the student gave, but they just point out the answers without considering the student's feelings. Sometimes they do. Um, uh, the second question is about the algorithm using the felt. So I wonder, uh, would you predict in the future there will be more self-supervised algorithm uh, for designing the models that can interact with humans? Or would you say the, like the expert knowledge would dominate the field? Expert like, knowledge would dominate what? Uh, like dominate the, like, data annotations, like uh, you know that uh, you're using the uh, human labeled data to construct the model that inter uh, like, like interact with patient, right? So um, that's still using some kind of expert knowledge, but sometimes the human beings 
the human, the expert cannot really solve the question. So how could the AI access those questions without the expert's knowledge? I'm trying to understand the question. Sometimes humans have difficulty agreeing. Yeah. Right? And then would, would AI be able to do make the decision? Right, so sometimes there will be raw data without any annotations because human beings cannot really annotate that data. So how could a uh, model do then? Well, I mean, that's exactly what deep learning is all about, right? It's the unstructured yeah. data and we don't have the time to go look at the data, but perhaps we need to feed it through a deep learning network. It can find some patterns, some under understand the different layers of abstraction and kind of make sense of this but it's not, at least some cases, it's not very interpretable. That's the trade-off, right? So yeah. sometimes maybe somebody can make a decision for you, but then it cannot explain why they made the decision, right? So right. the decision might be better, but then, uh, and that's exactly what's the problem in the medical science, right? So we, at the end, we just not want better decision for the patient. We want to explain it so that we can be held accountable, right? Same thing with hiring. Um, yeah, and also I think it's the same for language teaching. If you use the AI using the neural network and using deep learning to learn the language pattern and teach the student language pattern, sometimes students just ask, why should I use the pattern? But the model cannot explain. So I think that kind of learning process is not really helpful. Uh, it's not really helpful for the student to learn because the uh, like the model, the AI cannot explain explicitly what should be speaking in that case, uh, in that, that scenario, because of what, the reason. Um, so would you say like in the future, the model can explain the reason, the prediction they, they, it, it makes? Right, I mean, the interpretation, trust, uh, within the model, it's an area of research at this point. Uh, we are still grappling as to, okay, if there's something that's there, we know it's better, but we can't explain how should you get users trust? How should that interact with the user? Uh, for example, if I tell you that, okay, there is a algorithm um, that works 60% of the time and human performance is also 60%, who would you prefer? You prefer exactly. You prefer human, but now, okay. Let me just say, okay, the you know, but the machine performance six months ago was forty, three months ago was fifty, and two months ago was fifty-five. So now, which one would you prefer? Well, I guess it depends. Like if I'm a like a old school style person, I would choose human as well. <laughs> Right. I mean, many people would look at the machine and say, you know, it's on a trajectory that's improving. So if I just stay with it, hopefully in the future, if it maintains a trajectory, it will be yeah. better than human. So at, at the end, it's really about framing it appropriately and explaining it mm -hmm. so that people have the trust in it. Yeah. So there's a lot of this interaction design appropriately as well so that people feel that, you know what, it's not explainable, but at least I see why it's said it. And then hopefully this kind of makes sense. So there's, there's room for innovation there. And of course, we are working on making it more interpretable. So we'll see, hopefully, in the future, many of these black boxes being more interpretable. Right. Looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Sure. Hello again. I have some questions about your research. So I was reading an article where you spoke about language modalities, and I wanted some clarification on how you carp compartmentalize language modalities and have applied it to your agents. So that could be s in a way where say like the coding process or why you chose to include these language modalities over others. So why you chose language as a modality? Like language modalities such as like emotion or visualization and uh, I guess speech and tone. Why we chose them? Yeah. I mean, they're useful I mean, languages. Uh, conveys a lot of information. I mean, I mean research shows that. Um, um, and language is also a nice unit for interpretability. When you use language as a unit, it's really easy to look at how the expressions are aligning with the language. Because at the end, it's not just about 
uh, what we can infer from video or language. It's the, really the alignment. And I think language serves as a nice alignment point. Like when you say in certain things, how are the visual modality aligning appropriately? Uh, for example, with um, humor, right? So humor, why, sometimes why is it punchline? Why is it funny? Because we play around with language, right? So we say something and then all of a sudden there is something else, a double meaning word or something. That's when there is a punchline. And whenever there is a punchline, something happens on my face as well because I'm trying to build through a punchline. So when you use, start using language, it becomes much easier to look at the alignment across different modalities and also the misalignment. So in a sense, could, could your conversation coaches teach somebody to understand sarcasm? Um. So we worked on something that we didn't talk about. It's about humor detection. So we looked at TED Talk and we looked at uh, punchline detection. Like you, you know, he, for example, there is a laughter, right? So there is a tag called laughter in the transcript and we kind of went back four or five seconds before to see, okay, uh, how are they building up to this laughter, right? So, and can you predict the beginning of the punchline? And when you look at the punchline, you often see that what makes something funny when there is something odd, right? So when you play around with words, there are different, many different patterns we notice uh, that makes it a funnier punchline. And within that sarcasm is a category as well. So we can detect that element of it. Thank you so much. Thank you for a really interesting talk. It's fascinating. And um, it's often, I'm thinking, it's often said that the best way to learn something is to try to teach it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if by going through the process of building AI systems that emulate and analyze human interaction, what new insights are you gaining into how humans actually talk with each other? Great question. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm kind of trying to look back in the last 10 years, many things we have learned. Um, for example, in one case, uh, we noticed among the recruiter, right? So among the students who are rated to be a good interviewer, interviewees by recruiter, and versus students who are not rated very well. And one thing we noticed is that all the students who got a high rating use one word that the other group didn't. And anybody guess wh what that word be? What's very critical in a recruiting case? You? Um, I think that you are onto something and many people who rate it uh, high, they used we versus I, so that's one thing. So like that means a team, team player. And one other thing is they use le leadership, the word, uh, more often than the other folks. And it's not that you just go there and say leadership, 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 <laughs> it's just using it appropriately, right? So we saw like obvious things happening that we all know but many people don't, like use their pronouns, using appropriate words like leadership when you're being interviewed for a position like that. Uh, with, uh, with autism, we notice that there are many different ways you can smile, right? So often uh, when you smile based on computer vision, you have this AU12 being widened. When you have that, that means somebody is smiling. Now you could smile for many different reasons. You could smile because you are being polite with me you could smile because you're agreeing with me. You could smile because you are not agreeing with me. It's a, it's a different disagreement to smile. You could smile because you're disappointed. You could smile because you're frustrated. So we kind of looked at and understand, okay, what is the nuances across all these smiles? Because folks who have kind of difficulty interpreting some of the expression, they could confuse. They can, they can zone into the smile and say, okay, this is there, but then it's meaning something else. Um, so by understanding the nuance of the smile, we could go back and teach folks who have this difficulty to say, you know, this is what you'd be looking for in a conversation. So it's not confusing to you. That's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yes. So I guess my question is, um, again, back to using AI tools as intervention for, in this case, doctor training, which was your last example. Um, I say this because I come from like a medical family and I know that one of the main issues in doctor-patient encounters is not just the issue of 
empathy and like, you know, learning the human aspect of empowering and then explicitly telling somebody what's wrong with them. But um, as well, medical jargon is so already so difficult to understand. So the avatar that was being used, I noticed that phonologically it sounds very bland. So even though it has some intonation patterns, it sounds standard. So I was wondering whether there's any tools out there, like these avatar tools that are being used as interventions or training tools to doctors that, for instance, may have an accent or maybe as they converse, part of their personality is that they don't understand what's being said to them because they have a different language background, you know, because that's often some a really big ethical issue in doctor-patient encounters that they may not have the background. So could you train one of those tools to react that way so that, and kind of add something else, perhaps under explicit, that says linguistic awareness, so like the doctor knows that maybe they need something else. Right, it's, it's a great comment, and, and we certainly, we didn't look at that, uh, but that would be a nice thing to look at because many people may have different ways of framing things, and they may not even have the awareness to ask the right questions appropriately. Um, so being able to coach uh, the doctor about, you know, about language awareness to understand what they might be trying to say would be a really useful thing to say. So it would be nice to look at it. Uh, and going back to what you just asked, I just remember that even the doctor-patient conversation, uh, some doctors are brilliant, right? And they have got all the great degrees, all the credentials, but then if they don't have empathy, if they are not treating the patient right, the patient don't view them as competent. So for them, a doctor who has empathy is like super competent, even though they may not have the technical knowledge. So it's, it's really nice thing to see that how you can appear to be very, very knowledgeable and, and brilliant, just having some basic soft skills. I think we have time for one more question. So Shamini. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Uh, my question was along that uh, those lines, basically, uh, about social skills or about interviewing skills. Uh, so f uh, for example, if I'm a first time, like, you know, I'm going for a job interview, uh, but uh, the agent, like, you know, I've practiced through your platform and, uh, you know, but when I go in the real world and uh, the actual person might intimidate me, the voice or, you know, so do you have like, you know, nuanced people or, you know, nuanced uh, ways to kind of uh, prepare people because uh, no wonder how much, I know you guys give feedback uh, to people so that they improvise, uh, but finally when you go, in, uh, you know, to the real job interview, you don't know the person's, uh, uh, you know, the employer's, uh, prospective employer's voice or intonation and that might uh, cause a different effect. So how, you know, speaking to, practicing with the same conversational agent can have a different effect, but uh, so how do you, I mean, um, deal with that? So your question is, the scenarios might be very different. When you get a job, the, the way you interact will be very different than getting the job. And, and then how do you practice for different, a diverse set of scenario? Uh, not for skill sets, but just for like, you know, how to speak in the, uh, the social skills, basically, you know, uh, practicing with the same agent, you know, you're going to get, uh, uh, I mean, um, accustomed to it. So, uh, probably. S right, so you're saying that you, I may get better at the interaction by interacting with the same agent, but at some point I may just maximize it and not know what to do better. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we are currently working on, something we will, may do in the future is that I want you to go to a page and write down, I have this scenario coming up, maybe a tough conversation, uh, and I wanna practice that kind of conversation with an individual of that demographic background, and it can bring in the avatar of that, and then you can have practice that conversation. Uh, so I think that should be doable. Uh, especially with the latest technology to give that kind of scenario and for you to practice a diverse set of conversations. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that's all the time we have.
for now. Thank you for everyone for your questions. Thank you for um, all of you for being here in person and everyone online. So please uh, help me thank Dr. Esan Hawk one more time. Thank you very much. So I was fasting today. If I didn't appear energetic, I was probably hungry, but I was happy to be here. Glad you're here. Thank you.